A shout out to Athletic Brewing, the best damn non-alcoholic beer out there. Not a paid plug. I'm a brand ambassador, and I want to celebrate this amazing product. If you head to athleticbrewing.com and use the promo code BRENDAN020 at checkout, you get a nice little discount on your first order. I don't get any money, and they are not an official sponsor of the podcast, I want to be clear. I just get points towards swag and beer. So give it a shot. Try the Athletic Light or the Free Wave. They're my personal faves right now. And that's been a little bit of a learning curve for me to figure out how to silence those those internal critics that get louder when there's more of an external audience. AC and Effers, it's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, a show where I speak to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. I'm Brendan O'Mara. How's it going? Today's guest is none other than Erica J. Berry. Sound familiar? She was on the podcast way back in the early run for episode 76. That was in 2017. I shudder to think of the audio, but it's there if you want to check it out. Her first book is out, and it's called Wolfish. Wolf, Self, and the Stories We Tell About Fear. It's published by Flatiron Books. Funny aside, my father-in-law saw me reading this book, and he was like, what's a wolf fish? He had a point. It's sort of like catfish, right? Anyway, wolfish, not wolf fish. Go ahead and shelve Erica's book beside your copies of anything Leslie Jameson or Rebecca Solnit wrote. It belongs next to them, all right? Come at me, bro. We talk about how the wolf is the vector to tell this story. OR7, who is who was a famous wolf in Oregon, as something of an egg binder in this story. The terror of having to deliver on your book proposal and how Erica's writing and her relationship to writing has changed since we last spoke. Rich stuff. See, I'm finding that every five years or so, my relationship to writing kind of changes. I, I want to stop short of saying evolves, but it kind of evolves. So anyway, that, that, that was on my mind. So I wanted to get her sense of that. Make sure you're heading over to brendanomero.com for show notes and to sign up for my up to 11 Rage Against the Algorithm newsletter for a collection of things I think will add value to your writing life, your writing journey, your whatever. First of the month, no spam. So far as I can tell, you can't beat it. All right. Hey, why, why wait? Why wait any longer? Let's get after it with Erica J. Berry. Huh. Crazy. It's actually been 10 years because at Bowdoin College in 2013 was when you started really exploring this stuff and it's coming to fruition in Wolfish now, <laughs> 10 years later. Yeah, it is. I should have, um, I find it, you know, painful to listen to my own voice, of course, but if I'd re-listened to that earlier <laughs> one, um, it would be interesting to see that as like a core sample of how I was thinking about wolves and certainly some of the similar similar themes of sort of uncertainty and fear and um, how we relate to stories and folklore um, at that time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, where I wanted to kind of a good jumping off point too, given that it's been you know, five and a half ish, six years since we last spoke, um, you know, when you started, uh, you know, as a writer and you're like low to mid twenties and now you're in, you know, in your low thirties. So there's like a 10 year arc there. In my experience, the, the, my relationship to writing kind of evolves or, or matures, or I don't know how you want to call it, but the relationship to it changes, I would say, about every five years or so. Yeah. And um, I wonder for you, like in the last, you know, you've had like two, essentially two five year bumps. So, in a sense, you know, how has your relationship changed to it over the last 10 years, but maybe specifically in like five year chunks there? Yeah, that's a great, a great question. I think there's something about, those early years that I now look back um, quite sort of nostalgically in the way that I'm probably prone to. It's a bad habit, as we many of us are, where like, I felt like nothing, it was all just noodling around in a way. Um, and the sort of like experimentation felt really, nobody was watching. So there was nowhere to fall, really. Um, it was really sort of feral feeling. And I think at the time, I felt like the stakes were really high. But now I see like, 
you know, my early 20s, the sort of like hunger to just experiment. And in some ways, I think that sort of having that time and in my MFA where I was asked to take, I got to take classes in fiction and doing classes in poetry, like there was just this real, like, why don't you just associate and write about, I would like write about a pun and just like follow, oh, this word makes me think of two different meanings. And I'm just going to like write a thousand words about it. Um, and I wasn't thinking about the saleability or the scalability. I was just like doing it at that time. And I think, you know, there's a lot of benefits to studying creative writer, creative writing later in your career, in your, your life. Um, I ended up doing my MFA in that sort of early mid twenties period when I was young. And yet, like, I just didn't, there was the beauty of it was that I was just sort of like flailing and doing a lot. I was throwing a lot of stuff at the wall. And I would say the last five years I've been more sort of looking outward, like, Oh my God, I've like, I'm sitting on this pile of research. I've done so much writing and now I actually am in a different stage of like sifting and filtering. And that means that you're sort of inevitably tuned to like that question of audience and who you're filtering for. And I think there's been a lot of the challenges of writing have been silencing some of those external, the feelings of, okay, people are going to be watching and judging and, you know, like the inevitable parts of like pushing a part of yourself out into the world, publishing a book feels a little bit like self amputation. Um, I say that, you know, mm -hmm. having never come close to cutting off my own finger, but, um, yeah, I guess there's 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 a different tension about looking outward now and that's been a little bit of a learning curve for me to figure out how to silence those those internal critics that get louder when there's more of an external audience. Did you ever run into that that feeling of of, of when you were, you know, embarking on on these essays and you know, before you had a contract in place, let's say, you're like, "Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a you know, uh, be able to pursue this as, as a book. And then, of, mm. and then that moment comes and you're like, you're like, oh, oh shit, this is, oh, this is kind of real. Like, <laughs> was there a moment of panic where you're like, oh God, now I have to deliver? Yeah. Oh, totally. Um, and I think it really dovetailed in a strange way with the pandemic where the day that my agent was going to try to sell the book was the day I think the stock market crashed in New York. It was like that March 13th day. And I just remember not hearing anything from her thinking, maybe this is normal. Like things are fine, right? We had the proposal <laughs> all polished and glossed. And then sort of a few days later at that point, I'm like evacuating where I was living. I'm moving home. My teaching is going online. Like it's full chaos. And I just sort of thought the book is done. The book is done. And a few weeks later, we or, you know, we checked in a few days later and it was like, we're just going to hold the book. Obviously now it's not the time for the book. And I just, I felt this weird relief and this weird grief because this, well, yeah, I mean, there was just so much. And later the book ended up selling that September of that first pandemic year. And in a way I suddenly entered into this space where I was still kind of in quarantine. I was living near my parents. So I was trying not to be out and about too much, just thinking about that, you know, my pod. And so I was really just living in the world of this book. And that was definitely a dread inducing space, both because like the external mm -hmm. world was very scary and unfamiliar and also suddenly um, my internal world was like, you've got to write this book and now somebody's waiting for it. So yeah, there was a strange sort of the pandemic kind of hangs over the final project of this book in a weird way where I was sort of like writing it on this, a sort of dock in the sea, <laughs> adrift, mm -hmm. um, while the world felt really s scary externally. And I was, of course, writing about fear and how we live with that uncertainty. So yeah, I have lost the original thread of your question, but I think very much so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, you, you mentioned too that there there was the moment to your your agent and you were putting the you know buffing the the book proposal, and mm -hmm. that that un, unto itself is a labor, a laborious uh, chore, mm -hmm. if you will. And I, I recently went through it of a year long process of really honing a book proposal, and yep. and um, it was. It, it, my first experience in doing it side by side with an agent. So I was just like, I felt like an idiot yeah. most of the year because I just wasn't sticking the landing on various beats in it. And I've written a proposal before, but never to this extent. Um, so what was that process like for you as you were honing that? I imagine that's uh, something people would love to get a little insight into. Yeah. Well, first, congratulations. That is just like pushing it out there is horrifying. Um, it feels so <laughs> yes, crazy. <it> is. Um <laughs> I think one thing I've thought about since leaving 
my MFA um, when I talk to other young writers is that I wish I w- I didn't exactly know what a proposal involved when actually leaving studying. I loved my MFA. I had a great experience, but I did not really learn what a proposal was. And so when I queried my agent, I sort of had a list of the essays I was thinking of including. And at, at that point, I was really thinking of this project as an essay collection. Now I don't refer to it as an essay collection. It's a book, even though the chapters sort of hang. Um, there's there's three lines throughout them, but you know they, they are sort of self-contained in a sense as well. But at that initial stage, it was a process of saying why I was doing this project and why I was interested. And I think that that page of like, why are you writing this? Why are you writing this thing? Why are you writing it right now? And why will it resonate with readers? Um, I probably wrote that version like five times. Um, It takes so long to figure out sort of how to frame this thing, especially when it's been years and years and years of your life. Like what's the opening scene? I think thinking about it almost like a movie and like if the curtain's going to rise and someone hasn't seen this at all, what's the first moment that they see? Um, And especially for a project like this, that's dealing with both kind of on the ground immersive scenes, but also scenes of memory and research. I was sort of like, what is my hook to the reader. So there was some framing and we actually ended up um, putting part of the proposal with like a first person lens where I'm sort of talking very intimately in the voice that I think I ultimately found in the book, which is very rooted in my own embodied experience and my own lens and my own experiences of fear and of thinking about symbolic and real wolves. Um, So that felt important to actually center at the start of the proposal. I don't know if this is like how other proposals work, but it was interesting. My agent, Mariah Spence, is brilliant and sort of helpful at tetrising those different components. So I think I thought that, okay, from Googling online, which is what I was doing before working with her, I was like, I'm going to need this marketing section. I'm going to need this platform. And she was sort of like, well, every book and every proposal is a bit different and like, you know, fill in what you can with these sections, but then we're actually really going to focus on like foregrounding the research, foregrounding the voice, and ultimately attaching a couple writing samples, which for me were chapter or essays, I guess that I'd already written sort of excerpts that I saw as chapters, but also some pieces that I'd published externally. My New York Times letter of recommendation was in there, which is loosely about fear, a piece I'd published for Literary Hub about wolves and fear. Um, So I also had some like ancillary pieces, and I don't think I knew that like those kinds of things were allowed to go in a book proposal. So I think, you know, a general takeaway was just like, there's not one cut and dry format for that. And the sort of massaging the ratio of my own words, third person, first person, all of that came down um, later with the help of my agent. Yeah, the other question that has to be asked also, and is what I what I was wrestling with as well, and I imagine you did too, because wolves have been written about a lot, is like what new can be said mm-hmm. and and what hasn't been said and what are you bringing to it? So as you were peeling back that onion, so to speak, to get to the core of what this was, you know, what was the the challenge of trying to convince people that there was more to be said about the, uh, about the wolf and fear and, and how, what that embodies? Yeah, you know, um, reading Leslie Jameson's book, The Recovering, was really helpful for me in thinking about that, because she, I think, asked this question at one point, like, how do I write about addiction stories when they've been written about before, or when this subject has been well trod? And even just her asking that question and like verbalizing it, I felt like gave me permission to verbalize that. And in the introduction, I do sort of, I call that out, like the obviousness of it. Like there's so many wolf books. I think one of the things that immediately this goes back to like where I fit into it, you know, I think so with so many nonfiction projects, the writer is figuring out what, amount of themselves should be in shadow versus should be in the light. Ted Kuzer, the poet, has a great line about poetry being like you're turning up the dial. Um, You imagine a person standing in front of the window. And as you're darkening the world outside, the person's shadow appears in the window glass or disappears depending on how light it is outside. And I've thought of that metaphor a lot in nonfiction. And with this project, I was trying to figure out who am I? Am I just a sort of like reporter walking around? Am I just a researcher? Or is this about my family? Or is this actually about like my psyche? You know, there's sort of these different levels of how much of myself to put in. And at first, I sort of thought I'm looking at the wolf as a researcher or as a journalist. 
And I just, at a certain point, it was like so many people are doing that and they're doing it so brilliantly. And that's actually not where I'm most comfortable in my voice. And it wasn't until I sort of, I'd had an experience in graduate school where I was grabbed on a dark street in the middle of the, I guess not the middle of the night, it was like dusk and sort of felt my body shut down. It was this interaction with a stranger that was really scary and left me very sort of unsure how to move around the world. And I was thinking about Little Red Riding Hood a lot and thinking like, Little Red Riding Hood is actually tied to how I'm thinking about the wolf. And I don't want it to be. And I would like to really like untangle these two corollaries. And at the same time, like I'm interested in what it feels like to metabolize these stories and to grow up beside them. And I'm interested in not just the shadow wolf that these fairy tales have created or the symbolic wolf that is kind of living beside the real wolf. But actually, they've also, the same stories have created a sort of symbolic woman and a sort of shadow victim. If the, if the wolf is the villain of this big bad wolf story, like who is, someone is always in opposition to that. And so I found that like looking into my own experiences living with these stories actually became, I didn't feel like anyone else was doing, had done that with the wolf um, with quite the same intimate case. So I then, I guess... I think of this book as pretty omnivorous and realize at a point, well, maybe I can just do it all. And that felt crazy for a couple of years or months where I was like, I can't do it all. And then, you know, found editors and agents that believed that there was a way to dance between these different modes of research. And a lot of the, the chapters in the book, like some are very like personal essay-ish, memoir-ish, some are like very journalistic. And over the course of researching and writing these you know which hat did you did you like the most and have and just you know maybe felt most you know settled and rooted in yeah a good question I think at one point thinking about my own experiences in some way I had to separate and think like this isn't a journal entry this is finding a form of evidence and authority in lived experience in the same way that I'm going into the archives to look for evidence or I'm calling up this scientist to look for evidence. And so feeling like to create, to tell a certain story about maybe how we think about the boy who cried wolf or wolves and truth, I'm going to think about what it means to cry wolf. And that means I'm going to cite this person and cite this psychologist on the research of it. And also I'm going to think about this memory that I'm suddenly investigating in my own life and like seeing my own experiences as another form of, um, yeah, evidence, another tool to bring to the table to build my authority. Uh, I think my agent, again, Mariah Spence referred to it as like your, your lived authority becomes as important as like your learned authority. Once I sort of accepted that, I think it was easier to write those scenes. It was, it was hard. And I definitely wrote a lot of personal scenes that did not get in this book. They were, I was trying to work out my relationship with fear and with how I internalized the idea of the wolf externally and sort of the symbolic wolf as well. And I just was writing anything I could think of. And so a lot of that got carved away. Of course, like the research phases, I'm so happy um, going down rabbit holes. And I think I used to be sort of afraid of being a dilettante where I should be a specialist. I should be a wolf biologist to write about wolves, or I should be like a folklorist mm. or something. And I think giving myself permission and I think Joan Didion has a quote about this too. Like she's sort of like, I'm not an expert. Uh, my goal is, or my job is like, I bounce between the experts and just like owning that as your practice. And so once I, again, sort of accepted that that was going to be, that I was going to be calling up an expert and saying, you're going to need to sort of talk to me like I'm um, a teenager here because I don't know anything about linguistics and I want you to walk me through this thing. Um and that takes such a humbleness that was definitely uncomfortable at first. I think it's easy to think I should be smarter to be writing about this, but actually writing from a place of not knowing and writing from that beginner's mind and from sort of total openness to like, prove me wrong, um, teach me this, uh, mm -hmm. was actually so generative. Yeah, you're bringing up Didion. You know, you bring up the you know one of her uh, sort of famous insights about it's a very like Janet Malcolm esque. Uh, exactly. Yeah, insight that you know the journalist is always selling someone out, and that's actually something that uh, in our first conversation that you know you said you know writers are always selling people out, and you always chafed against that because mm -hmm. that's not how you want to be. And that was you know five and a half years ago when we spoke. Mm -hmm. um, is that something 
in your relationship to Diddy and that you still push against? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you remembered that. I'd been thinking about that at the time because it has been a, it's been a thing I've grappled with. And now I think I, I call myself less a journalist than I did at the time. And I think Rebecca Solnit has written about like the difference between being a journalist and an essayist. And like, if I'm an essayist that does interviews and I, I don't know, my relationship with those genres maybe doesn't matter. Um, but I'm very sensitive to that. And I think writing about wolves, which are politically controversial, is challenging for for me because I I feel very, I usually relate to the person I'm talking to and I'm empathizing with their story and then trying to figure out how to bring these different stories into conversation and like find the nuance there means that you're sometimes not, of course, saying exactly the any one party line. Um, and I felt like that was important to do with this project. The wolf exists on so many like of these binaries and I didn't want to feel like I was, I've been very aware of not wanting to sell the rancher out or the, you know, conservationist, but rather to bring them into conversation. I think D- Didion's point, I can see it now with some, when you actually have a book, there are, these power dynamics are sort of crystallized in a different way. But going back to even that piece we talked about six years ago, The Beast of Bray Road, I recently got a message on Facebook from somebody who had found that piece and he lived in rural Wisconsin and he'd recently read it like within the last six months. And he said that he knew the subject of the piece who'd written about werewolves and he'd always judged her. He was a journalist and he'd always judged her. And he said that reading my essay about her gave him more empathy and helped him see her in a new way. And I thought, my God, that's like the best possible thing I could hear um, after writing about someone is that other people are able to like bring a new empathy to the table. Yeah. And you know, speaking of that essay too, and I, uh, when I was reading Wolfish, I was expecting to basically read that essay like word for word in, in the book. And it surprised me that it wasn't in there at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, it just kind of gets to this point of, uh, I guess, selection mm-hmm. and, and, and what, what felt like it, at the time serve the true story piece, which is the little uh, chat book thing that you wrote for creative nonfiction mm-hmm. versus what serves the, the larger book. So yeah, yeah. You know, was that, what was that, uh, the calculus there of like, say not including this yeah. and including other things, the sort of consensus from the editorial powers that be my wonderful agent and editor and teams um, were that that one was a little bit less, I'm trying to think how it was described. It wasn't as personally rooted for me. I was sort of more floating through there. And this book is pretty um, intimate with my own relationship and evolution with fear very much in my own body as a young woman. And I think that project was more, you know, to go back to that earlier metaphor of like how much I was, me, the narrator, sort of turned up or turned down. I think I was less in that piece in a certain way and I had it in an early draft and then we were sort of thinking, well, what if we wrote about that piece was about werewolves and werewolf stories and like, what if there was another way to think about the werewolf? Like how does the werewolf really um, relate personally to these grapplings I'm having with fear? And I started thinking like, maybe it's interesting not to look at how somebody else is telling the story of the werewolf but to look at when I've actually felt like a werewolf or like how these werewolf stories, um, how we metabolize them sort of internally in terms of when I have scared other people. And so that ended up being the essay that went in is about when I was in Sicily and there was a poisoning incident, shall we say, that I was involved in. (laughs) Um, And that became sort of a moment to think again about about werewolves in a different context that was a little bit closer to my own narrative thread. But the yeah, stuff that's... that's left on the cutting room floor, like that's, that's hard. I was, I was very tied to that other essay. And so that does speak to like, in some ways, this book is not the, the total capstone of my project about wolves. Like there's all these other pieces and strands that have been floating around on the side. <laughs> Yeah, that that uh that essay from Sicily when you were at the cooking school and you know the the Mandrake, was it yeah. was Mandrake there it is yeah and there was I don't know it was it just uh the way it was prepared or the way it wasn't prepared that became toxic it just was a toxic plant um and so yeah. we 
foraged it essentially without knowing. We'd never been told about this toxic plant. I was living at a cooking school and we hadn't really been warned. And, you know, so there was a level of hubris. Like we thought we were going to be safe. We just didn't, we couldn't imagine that this bad thing could happen to us. And I was living there at a time where I felt we were quite, we lived in this like secluded little bubble of this like very idyllic cooking school in the middle of Sicily. Um, so when eventually this very near-death experience sort of unspooled, it felt very surprising, whereas so much of my other experiences with fear had been deeply anticipated or I'd been a big worry war. And this time I was like just chilling, having a great time, drinking wine, hanging out, and like I have the scariest night of my life. So um, that moment, this sort of quick transformation felt there was a um, – sort of werewolfishness about that and actually in looking at the history of werewolves we found that those some of those legends had kind of roots in similar potential stories of people eating plants like that and also in the Mediterranean and so then it was like okay this is actually kind of an unignorable thing yeah and it's one of those deals too where you know you you had like an anxious fearful streak in you yeah. and then in that moment where here you are kind of letting your guard Makes down sense. and be like, yeah, you know, like trying to be a little more blase. And the moment you do, it's like you almost <laughs> exactly. kill yourself and two other people. Exactly. I know. I mean, I think in some ways I was just as horrified by that moment, you know, to write about the wolf as a symbol of fear. I really had to say like, do I personally have anything specific to say about fear? And I'm not sure that I, do any much more than anyone else. But I think any one person's life, you could zoom in on the moments that sort of shape our relationship with fear. And even those like micro moments are going to do something to you, right? And I think there were moments where I had felt very much like um, victimized um, with, from scary encounters that were not really big moments. Like they were not like near death, near murder experiences. As far as I could tell, they were just sort of like bad moments. But then this was an experience where like, I was so rattled, but part of that was because I'd almost really harmed someone else. And the sort of shock of being like, oh my God, I did something really scary. I participated with my own hands. Like I'm culpable was almost as sort of horrifying to me as like, you know, some of these experiences where I'd felt um, threatened myself. Yeah. There's a moment, and I believe it's in that, that chapter two where you cite the high wire artist, you know, yeah. uh, Philippe Petit. Um, about what does he say? He said, I see fear as an absence of knowledge. And that, that's true too. Like the more you can kind of educate yourself on certain things is a way you can learn how to dance with an anxiety or quell anxiety. Sure. So it is in there is kind of this lesson of so sometimes the more, you know, the more you, you might be fearful, but also the more, you know, you'd be like, okay, like I can kind of uh, defang this. Well, as and well. I think so much like, the idea, the projects that are so interesting to me essayistically, or with the essayistic brain, maybe they're not essays, but they're where the writer doesn't know how they feel about something and they're like trying to write their way into an understanding. And I definitely didn't set out to write this book being like, okay, I'm kind of writing this as kind of an anxious wreck and I'd like to feel better by the end. So I'm going to like <laughs> investigate the stories we tell about fear and anxiety. And yet at a certain point, I'm a completely different person at the end of the book than I am at some of the scenes in it. And I don't know how much of that is growing up, but I think part of it is just um, writing into that and really examining sort of the cultural scaffolding and narratives around the things that scared me or that I was told should scare me. And like, actually, that really helps. And so, you know, I do think I'm always aware of the idea that writing isn't therapy and like that we shouldn't it's not catharsis. I mean, it like feels like peeling off your fingernails sometimes to write about your own life. And yet I think there's a degree of like, um, sometimes that does happen. Like you do, I de you like defang your own brain writing into it. And I think that's such an important um, part of this process in some ways. Yeah. They, to, to that point of feeling even let's just call it like a, a performance anxiety of some kind like I, I feel that a lot when I go into these interviews or even when I'm interviewing people for be it an article or book stuff it's may, maybe more for podcast stuff because I, I t try, tend to leave myself open to a little more discovery when I'm doing stuff for articles or, or yep. books um, but for this is sort of a different interview yep. beast and I find that when I'm most anxious it's when I'm, I'm not as prepared and I always equate it to like a 
a quarterback mm. who has to watch a lot of game tape, and the more tape he read he sees, he can read more defenses. He can oh, see good. where things are yeah. going, and it's like if I do my film work, I can go where the guest is going and have and be armed to go in the direction that the quote defense is sort of I can read that defense and go in those directions and uh so I don't know I, I don't know about you but do you find that if you have a, de- a certain measure of performance anxiety and what you're doing that preparation is your you know salve for that's a great point also really my brain is going trying to understand football that was a good practice for me i'm trying to i'm trying to become a sports person i've decided low stakes following sports is yeah Yeah. i speak in sport metaphor often it's a a blessing this is is good this is good practice (laughs) flexing that muscle for me um yeah i think that's such a good point and it maybe does go back to both this sort of privilege of being able to have beginner's mind is this phrase i don't know like who coined that what that idea is my mom recently said it and it's just really stuck where in you know you going into an interview where you're just sort of like responding very impulsively to what people are saying like there can be a beauty in that kind of static but it can also it can be terrifying when you don't know where that's going to go right and similarly i think um I feel that whether I'm on the page or doing an interview and I think um, like what's an example of somebody I talked to the ecology of fear biologist who I spoke with Liana Zanette um, who's Canadian and we had this wonderful conversation where I was trying to read up on her like field which she's studying which is sort of like how predators say influence the other animals in the landscape and these sort of this idea of um, eco- and an ecology of fear that is that is shaped. And in the process of our conversation, I was like, okay, at some point, maybe I'm going to be open about the fact that I'm also writing about humans. And I'm trying to think about ecologies of fear in human environments. And I don't want to tell her a scientist who's studying animals, like, I, I want to be aware of like drawing a metaphor that's not there or of, like creating a corollary um, that's scientifically inaccurate. And yet the sort of like poet inside my brain is like, of course, there's this kind of like static connection that's being built. And we ended up having this wonderful conversation where we were both talking about our experiences as women to a point uh, walking in streets. And she's then bringing up like how raccoons um, move around when there's badgers or, you know, um, it just, it sort of went off the rails in a way that was exactly sort of what I'd hoped, but I wasn't sure we would get there. And so I think a lot of that is like building a sort of trust and humbleness. And for me, it's been breaking some of those rules that I thought I would do as a journalist, which is like, you're not going to talk about yourself, but giving myself permission to be like, well, I'm not sitting here writing a strict journalistic book about wolves. I'm also very much talking about my own experience. So I'm going to give myself permission in the interview to say like, I have this feeling, which is that I'm bringing your scientific research about animals into my experience as a human. And can you just tell me like how wrong that is? Like, is that accurate? And (laughs) that being um, able to sort of say things like that actually opened up really interesting interview conversations, um, even if there's not a clear scientific extrapolation. Can you pinpoint or or maybe you can speak to like when was the first time that you were like very – cognizant of fear and your own fears? Yeah, that's a very good question. I I write about something in an early chapter about Little Red Riding Hood in the book where I had just gotten to college and I was on the East Coast and everything was very unfamiliar and strange as like, you know, your first months of college often are for people. And I was walking home from the library one night and saw a group of students that I could, they were male, it seemed coming towards me on the path. And I sort of told myself, okay, you feel a little bit nervous, but like nothing wrong has ever happened. Like I'd never had any really scary experiences that made my own body feel at risk. And to that degree, I was incredibly privileged as a teenager. Um, And so I'm also in this like liberal arts campus bubble, like everything still I'm sort of telling myself that I'm just being irrational, that I'm sort of aware. 
Um, and as these group of people get closer down the path, I see that they're wearing white t-shirts over their heads and they've like got, got their eye, they have eye holes, like slits cut for their eyes and on their hands, they're wearing mm. these white socks and they're sort of glowing in the moon. And, um, you know, I, I suddenly couldn't tell who these people were. Um, they were, it seemed like athletes, they were like big guys and, uh, it was terrifying. And I stood there and they surrounded me in a circle and I was just, my brain was like sputtering. Like this is this thing that growing up in a young woman's body, you're sort of told that you're going to run into someone scary on the street who you're not going to know and they're going to want to hurt you. And I had really been taught to be brave and to be fearless and like came of age in this kind of like girl power, early 2000s phase. And this was the moment where I was like, oh, wait, it's happening. And like, what do I do? And how, um, it felt so bad. And so I, I, I actually just like ran through their hands. They didn't do anything. And it, it turned out that they weren't probably threatening. They were like drunk soccer players that were being hazed. Um, but something about that as a specter of fear, like it made me aware that that could happen. And later when I had other experiences that were more sort of like tangibly upsetting, I do think the imprint of that that night just sort of like I think in the book I say it like opened a little window of how the world could be that you might be walking down the street and the stranger wouldn't just pass you but that he'd instead like surround you or you know something would happen and so I think there's a number of incidents like that that were sort of all these little splinters like they didn't feel inherently like this is this big trauma with a capital T um, in her book Girlhood, Melissa Phoebos refers to these moments as events, like they're not quite sure what to say um, about these sort of like micro moments. Um, but I think at a certain point, I became aware that like those were accumulating in a way where I was sort of moving through the world completely different than I had a few years earlier. And I think of it like, you know, you're in the dog park and before you've just been like running around this like off leash dog. And suddenly I was like the leash dog standing near the fence. And I couldn't quite figure out like when it had happened, but I had sort of become someone who was like walking into my house and checking under the bed with, um, you know, looking for people in my house. And I couldn't figure out like why I was doing that or when it had happened. And so I be it became very like imperative to me to like go back and think about what had gone awry in my, <laughs> in my brain or in the world that I had gotten there. You said a moment ago too, like how maybe maybe the stranger will just pass you by, but maybe not, and maybe they'll sit next to you on yeah. a train. <laughs> and that was so incredibly chilling. What what you went through there because you just want to just be guarded and ignore yeah. what's happening. But this guy, I mean, you were truly you know, there was a there was a real yeah. threat. There. Well, and I think that was an interesting. I was taking a train to a writer's residency, thinking like I'm just going to write about wolves. Like I kept just thinking like I'm going to be able to write about this animal as a four-legged animal and I'm going to be able to write about the science and the history and blah, blah, blah. And then like on this Amtrak ride across the country, I sort of had an experience with a man who I didn't know. He didn't know I was a writer. He wrote me these scary letters um, that he gave to me and um, the we ended up, the man got kicked. I don't know. I won't spoil it. It's in the first, <laughs> it escalated. Um, and <laughs> I think there were all these moments where I was, it just became clear that like to be, to have a body while you're going through the process of researching, like my body is like a youngish white woman's body is a particular sort, but any sort of reporter has a different body that they're bringing into their reporting. And like to acknowledge that um, and the ways that that both like opens and closes doors, I became interested in that. And of course, Didion writes about that, like being, and I quote her, um, the sort of privilege of being hypothetically small and unassuming. Um, I'm thinking of the Dylan Roof article by Rachel Kodzikonza. Am I saying her name right? Um, it's such a brilliant article about she goes to Dylan Roof's parents' house um, and she's a black woman and she's very open about what it's like to knock on their door at night. And I think she goes in and has a beer with them and like sort of peeling back that um, look at us, look at these power dynamics, like who are our bodies in the room as we're doing these investigations. I'm really interested in that kind of nonfiction. And I started feeling like my own experiences of fear are sort of leaking in porously to how I'm writing about these stories of fear on the page or in history or in science. Um, and what if I let that happen rather than sort of trying to silo them and separate them as I'd been doing in the first part of my process? The book, like you said, said a while ago that you originally kind of conceived it possibly as just 
essays, standalone essays. And I think some of these can kind of stand stand alone, but you do you do tether them together with a through line, specifically OR seven, which is a very famous wolf in, in Oregon. Here, so maybe you can just speak about for one the challenge of creating a through line throughout the whole thing where you're going on sort of different mm-hmm. tangents mm-hmm. for lack of a better term uh but also this wonderful incredible life of OR7 this this wolf that dispersed and made its way through Oregon and northern California yeah. yeah you know that was an interesting thing because centering his story his journey i will say he left his pack when i was in college first starting to look at wolves for my environmental studies thesis in 2013 so He was first my kind of window into, he became this kind of wolf celebrity. There were social media accounts following him. And I'm like a, you know, hungover college student in my library reading about this wolf. Like why I've never cared about wolves before. Honestly, I wasn't like a big wolf person. I think some people assume I must have been to write this book, but I was just like a member of the curious public that was like, wow, this wolf is a spectacle. It's like breaking all these headlines. And I became really interested in how people were watching the wolf and what it was kind of conjuring. And then the wolf came back to Oregon and eventually got a family and a pack. And um, that pack started like some of his offspring were predating on livestock and it became sort of headline grabbing in another way. And by the time I moved back to Oregon and was actually selling the book, I won't totally ruin the ending, but like something else had happened to OR7. And I was talking to editors actually during the auction process about the whole kind of container of the book and the chronology and the sort of backbone that holds this research together, which is kind of um, my own relationship with fear as it's evolving kind of as through a coming of age reckoning and also my own research into the wolves because there's sort of like a meta through line of me going on these research trips and, you know, thinking about the subject. And it was like, oh, wait, we kind of... OR7 is also a through line. He'd been um, sort of there conceptually, but I hadn't thought about kind of writing him in as a character until actually those editorial conversations. And I think that's one thing that, you know, for other writers who might be facing that process of getting to have editorial conversations with potentially interested publishing um, teams is what a beauty it is to talk to these really smart people um, and have this sort of editorial workshop sessions where because I sold this book on proposal, it wasn't um, a fin- I didn't sell it as a finished book, even though I'd written many parts of it. They were sort of weighing in and saying, we think it would be interesting to like have a wolf kind of um, be a through line as well that people can kind of hold on to. And I kind of liked the idea of this wolf coming in and out of the pages and then like disappearing for 30 pages. Um, and that's frustrating on a degree as a reader because you sometimes just want to like dwell with this wolf but that's also how it felt like to be a human watching OR7 is like sometimes you don't there's like no good updates and um, his caller is sending signals but we don't always get them and what's that frustration of like being a human wanting to really closely understand and watch this animal and you just can't because they're kind of inscrutable and so I was interested in sort of representing on the page the way that my journey away from home, his journey away from home are sort of like weaving. um, And, you know, sometimes I'm looking to him and I'm feeling inspired or there's a sort of metaphor there, but ultimately it doesn't mean anything. It's just like his life is coming in and out of contact with my life. And neither of us inherently are that special. We're both just like two bodies that you're sort of, the lens is zoomed in on. He's wearing a collar. So his long distance journey was trackable. There's other wolves that took long distance journeys that just probably weren't tracked in that way. Um, and similarly, like I'm sort of leaning closely to my own life just because it's, it's a life I can see. And I think there's something kind of, there's in, something interesting in that um, parallel. Yeah. And, and wolves are obviously they're they're pack animals, but occasionally you get one that wants to disperse and will go out and try to form its own pack. And that was the story yep. with OR seven, and you know you and you know you were raised to be like very you know you, your parents like instilled a lot of I don't know I think a lot mm-hmm. of strength to disperse mm-hmm. on your own. So in what ways did you see? overlap in your own life and the in the lives of say an OR seven like a yeah. dispersing wolf? Yeah, I think I was interested in this idea of like a lone wolf in a human perspective, I thought was like, okay, it's this wolf that just like wants to be alone and really doesn't want to be with anyone else. And actually, the more I learned about wolves, the more it was like, oh, wait, usually a lone wolf is just 
a young member of the pack that's leaving because, you know, they are aware of somehow subliminally aware of like the problems with lupine incest. And so they're like, I should go find someone else, find another (laughs) territory. And it's actually kind of normal to be a lone wolf. And it doesn't mean that you're not looking for anyone. It means that you are looking for someone um, or for another, um, you know, another wolf. And I thought there was sort of a poetry in that. And I think that idea of I was never leaving my family because I wanted to get away from my parents. I'm very lucky, like have a loving, supportive family. I'm very close with them, but I felt like I was leaving to like, to find my way back to them in a way. Um, And, you know, it's interesting if the pandemic hadn't happened, would I have, I was teaching in Michigan at the time and my job ended and I sort of like fled home when things went online as many people did when it like wasn't sure what else was going to happen. And so that sort of became my boomerang trajectory. Um, And I don't know that I knew I would come home. Um, OR7 eventually did also come back to Oregon and settle down with a pack, not right where he'd been raised, but in this different part too. And so I think I was thinking about like, what does it mean to, it's messy to come back and to be in contact with other bodies and for or7 that was like having a family suddenly and being around sheep and cows like there's a lot of room for kind of these intersections that are messy in a way that like when you're just one wolf wandering in a sort of rural mountain area there's like less ways that things can go wrong i guess um and there's that's true kind of for my own life too like the messiness of entanglement and of coming home Um, was very real, but I was kind of attracted to that. I think I'd spent a lot of time just thinking the most exciting thing was to go off on the adventure and to go set out and move to this country where I don't know anyone or move to a state where I don't know anyone. And actually I was like, what if at this point it's kind of brave to come back and just like sink into the messiness of being entangled with people who I've grown up with. And that felt like its own new adventure. (laughs) And what was it about, or what is it about wolves that makes such a good vector well, that was such a good vector for you in just telling this this story of you know of fear and stories we sort of have in yeah. the self as the yeah. subtitle. I suggests. think um, that is like the million dollar question. I should have the real quick beat response to that. You know, I think part of it is very much tied to coming to terms with the idea that the wolf in the Western storytelling tradition I grew up with was kind of the perfect villain. It was the kind of canonical one and realizing that like my own identity as a young woman was sort of the, the opposition to that. And if I was having a hard time accepting or understanding how to live in my own body in certain ways, um, it became interesting to like, look at the opposite pole, which would be the wolf. Um, And of course, I'd already been researching wolves and was fascinated in what they told us about um, kind of conversations around America and mythology and, you know, wolves. There's this huge legacy of the expulsion of wolves is really formatory in like the building of statehood in Oregon. Like the first law that was passed in my home state was about getting rid of wolves and a bounty on them. And you have, you know, these early American policies that were like trying to force for, forcing essentially indigenous inhabitants to like kill wolves and turn in their wolf heads for for money um for example in colonial america so there's all these legacies that i felt like the story of the Amer- of the story of america and the story of oregon uh to name my home state cannot be actually told without talking about wolves and at the same time the story of my own uh, body as being scared, maybe out walking on a dark street, like that's also really influenced by wolves. And so it ended up feeling like, oh my God, wolves are in everything, like everywhere I see there's wolves and I just have to lean into that. <laughs> yeah. Is it one of those deals now where oh you just God. see it everywhere? Just today like... <laughs> I was like taking notes on something, which was, yeah, anyway, about a lot of the East coast was deforested, you know, like the hilltops were blackened because they were cutting down trees to try to rid the area of wolves. And I was like, you know, this is true in England. There's, there's other evidence of that, but I came across that again today and was like, Oh my God, the landscape looks the way it does in say Maine, where I went to college, perhaps because 
wolves were driven out, right? And that led to part of this deforestation. And so when you start to look at that, like I'm such a sucker for that kind of interconnectivity, um, that the wolf as a vessel, it's really overwhelming to look at like early forest policy for me, but to look at how it might be influenced by just the wolf, using the wolf as that vector, as you say, became a helpful lens to like look at all these other facets of American mythology and sort of stories around wilderness and fear. Yeah, there is a, a moment too where you talk about the wolf as um in it, it in it the predator prey relationship and how by it, it was when the you know your mother got oh, a tick borne yeah. illness and things were things were you know really kind of yeah. touch and go for a bit and it brought up this whole idea of you know the the predators are in there because they. They, by feeding on certain prey, they are able to mm-hmm. keep certain diseases under wraps and so forth. And there's this whole, you know, the interconnectivity of of an, of animals that somebody we take for granted just for mm-hmm. capitalistic gain and uh, mm-hmm. and expansion. And then maybe you can just mm-hmm. speak to that it just incredibly complicated web of influence uh, and what happens when you start to the depredation of an apex predator gets ripped out of there and how out of of whack. Yeah. I mean, that was sort of fascinating to me because I think I'd always thought like, well, wolves belong out there because like they should just be allowed to walk around like the rest of us or like, wouldn't it be cool for me to see a wolf? And it wasn't until I was in college and my mom got sick and we heard that this t- it took a long time to figure out that it was a tick-borne disease and somebody sort of offhandedly said well we have more ticks because we have more rodents because the predators are gone and like this whole sort of like ecological um train is askew and i had never thought of like predators actually playing a role in something as sort of trickle down the line causing humans to get sick and you know a lot of the research on that has come out of yellowstone national park where wolves were reintroduced in the 90s and have sort of been um been studied for the ways that maybe songbird populations are thriving or certain willow trees are not getting grazed as much because the elk are more aware because of the wolves and many of the researchers i spoke to were sort of wary of that narrative going too far like saying wolves will heal these broken landscapes like wolves save all the other animals like that is probably too simple and that's sort of putting the wolf on a pedestal as this sort of savior animal which is in some ways you know as much of a um mythology as the wolf as this like villain animal like it's it's another extreme at the same time um i think it was really helpful for me to see the way that wolves have really, as with other apex predators and often in tandem with apex predators, if you're in a landscape with bears and wolves, like, you know, they'll eat each other's carry on. There was something about like wolf kills, helping to feed grizzly bears as they're coming out of hibernation. Like that's actually, they're supporting each other in these weird interconnected ways. And that's so fascinating. And, you know, there's some research about um, wolves in an area will scare deer off the roads and so deer were actually not being hit by cars or cars were were hitting fewer deer. So like it was saving all of these ro- um, crash, <laughs> it was like saving humans and saving money. This was in Wisconsin. And like that sort of study is so fascinating because yeah. you would never think they were trying to make an economic argument for like, we should support wolves here because fewer humans are getting in car crashes. And like the discrepancy between those two things before I started researching this I would have never connected them. And I am pretty interested in the ways that like, how can we think about kind of coexistence in the land in ways that aren't just about, well, this is better for humans. This is better for human economics, economic life. But like, how can we really think about this web that we're all in? Um, Not just as a sort of like aesthetic, it's nice to have everyone sharing the land, but like, what are we actually, how are we shaping the land together? Now, as a, you know, getting close to the end of our conversation here, um, you know, last last time we spoke, you had you had said that you were a pretty bingey writer. It is uh, is that still the case that you're more of a binge writer than uh, someone who does it sort of methodically every single day? <laughs> That's um, yes, and you know what? I've thought about how I said that because I think I've had a really hard time accepting that now that my I took off. Um, yeah, I was teaching full time or 30 hours a week, four days a week in high school um, during the sort of phase when I was doing this honing of the proposal and really beginning to focus on this book. And I just the day I wasn't teaching would just be this like giddy, absolutely full of writing day. Like I got so much done when I only had one free day. 
And in the periods afterwards, now my life is much more start and go. I'll be, I taught for a month this summer quite intensively uh, in Oxford, but then I like, you know, spending a month at a residency where I have suddenly all this unstructured time. And it's such a gift to have that unstructured time. And also I keep thinking every day should be like the rush of words that it was when you only had one free day a week. And Mm -hmm. um, it's not, you know, uh, it's harder. And so I do think accepting the binge, I just have to keep telling myself that. And I think Blair Braverman was the first person who sort of gave, she was doing um, dog sledding stuff. And she was like, give yourself permission to make some days about the writing and some days about living off the page and doing other things. And I think one of the things about my practice as a sort of writer who's thinking omnivorously across discipline and field is like, you're going to find I'm, I'm constantly discovering things when I'm not trying to. So like one example is I was remember working, writing about wolves and a friend was like, let's go to this documentary at an art museum. And I was like, I can't go. I got to work. But as things happen, you know, it's like 7 PM, you have a beer. You're like, obviously I'm not going to work. I'm going to go to this movie. And in the movie, which was about police militarization, it was just a documentary. I would have to think of the name, but it was wonderful. And there was uh, a bit about these sheepdog seminars that, Uh, where police officers were trained with a certain language discourse of some people are wolves, some people are sheep, the wolves are just always going to attack, you just have to kill them. Like, it was a really, um, a lot of this fairy tale language of the wolf reincarnated in ways that had real life stakes, right? Um, And it was this fascinating connection that I would have never discovered if I'd told myself, no, Erica, doing work is writing a thousand words a day. Like, in some sense, giving myself a leash to be like, now you're going out, you're seeing a movie, you're wandering around, you're talking to people, you're at a museum, like, that's where those connections are coming out of. So I think in a way, like giving myself permission to expand what that writing looks like, sometimes it's not on the page, it's like me in a, at a movie taking notes on my notes app, um, and understanding that that might come back in a useful way later. Yeah. In terms of, you know, having, let's say, you know, maybe it's a Tuesday or something and that's the day you can do that. Sometimes that Tuesday isn't going to always be there. So in what ways do you try to fold in some degree of structure so time just doesn't get away from you? Oh, it's so good. And I'm obsessed with um, apps for this. Um, Somebody recently told me about Toggle, which you can use to sort of track your time. So I will do it like I get pulled into say reading research articles so I try to keep track like if I'm just if I'm trying to write 500 words that day on an essay maybe I'll I'll start my toggle track as I start reading scholarly articles say and after 45 minutes I'm going to cut myself off and then I'm going to start a new toggle and I'm going to tag that like writing and so by the end of the day I can see what percentage is spent on and actually for answering emails I do that too like what percentage is email what percentage is research what percentage is actual writing um and there's a great method that I think was from my grad school professor Sugi Ganeshanathan where you have a calendar and you use glitter gold stars to mark every day that you write something Mm. and um there's something about sort of tricking your brain into like you see this chain of glittering things and you just can't stop (laughs) like you you want to beat yourself (laughs) and I think like gamification I'm here for it I want there to be more gamified ways to get me to write because I do find that that's useful and I've had accountability groups with people Jamie Attenberg's um, sprints of a thousand words a day of five what's what's it called thousand words of summer like those things are really useful and finding ways to have that accountability even right now I'm at the beach for a couple days and I have a friend who's texting me like okay, how's the essay you're going working on? And like building in those kind of checks and balances are really helpful. And I use freedom on my devices to block out social media at certain times and even block out the internet and just like really have to be, it's a lot of carrots and sticks for me um, to build in that structure when the days are sort of loosey goosey. Yeah, I love the idea of an accountability partner. It's like a gym partner. It's like yeah. you oh can gosh. easily skip out on your own, but like if you've got a partner there, it's like ah, yep. I got I got to be there for this person. I got to spot them. Totally. Well, and I think I've done this too, where you say like, okay, on a Friday, we're each going to send each other a thousand words every Friday and we're not going to read it or there's going to be no pressure to respond. Like if it's in my friend's inbox, maybe he's going to read it, but um, 
that's not the point. And then the next week you send another thousand words and something about that was really useful. I've done that when I'm in like big generative stages and I do it with my sister sometimes where we just say, you have to send 300 words every morning and we're just each going to send them and there's not, it's not going to be workshopped, which creates a little bit of a lower stakes to just do it. Um, but I really like that approach. Nice. And uh, Erica, as I like to, uh, something, uh, a little something new that I've done over the last uh, couple of years uh, since uh, last time you were on is that uh, I like to end these conversations by asking you, the guest, a recommendation for the listeners. And we're, granted, you, do, you did say Toggle and Freedom, which are great recommendations. Uh, but I'd say if you have anything else, what might you recommend for the listeners out there? Oh, OK. Love that. OK, well, the best book that I read in the last year about writing, this is probably... I'll think of something that maybe more people have not read, but for those of you that maybe haven't read it, Annie Dillard's A Writing Life was so revelatory for me. And she has this one pack passage about spend it all, shoot it, save, like, don't save anything. Don't sit it. Don't sit on mm. it. Just like charge forward with the exciting <laughs> things that you're yeah. writing. And yeah. that now is on my desk as a quote. And I've flipped open the book so many times when I just want to like get in that writer brain um so that w has been a favorite craft book to revisit you know i think one book that i think is coming out this year with bloomsbury um i got a copy in the uk a few years ago but it's daisy hildyard's the second body and actually daisy's fiction i'm a big fan of too it was there was some recently published in orion and she has a new book coming out that i have not read yet um that's fiction a novel but she writes she wrote this book, The Second Body, that's sort of essentially sort of a book length essay on thinking about how humans are a part of animal life. And she has this idea that like we have our first body, which is sort of like, you know, bounded by our bones. It's like what we think about being our body. And then this idea of the second body, which is like the parts of ourselves that are sort of like leeching outwards or, um, you know, maybe what we're consuming or this idea of like a larger footprint that sort of interacting with the world, too. And I don't know, she goes and she visits a butcher and farm animals and she's like by a river as it's flooding her house and like the the porousness between self and world, especially in an environmental lens, I felt like she just captured so wonderfully. It like changed my whole conception of what it meant to like have a body in the world. Um, and so anything Daisy Hildyard writes, I'm now really attuned to. Awesome. Well, I love it. And, and Wolfish was such a... a, a wonderful insightful journey to go on it felt like uh it felt like uh like a wolf migration if you were just going going to like all these other all these places in the landscape of of fear and your story and or7 and just wolf as a cultural totem it was just uh such a wonderful experience so i just got to commend you on the job well done it's so great to be able to talk to you about it erica well, thanks so much for spending time with it and for, you know, following the wolves and I for, for a couple of years now. <laughs> oh, thanks for listening, CNF. Thanks to Erica for coming back on the show. It was a real treat to get to talk to her again. It's amazing that it's been nearly six years since the last time she was on the show. And the last time I actually spoke to her, you know, like many people on the show, I've never met them face to face or physic you know physically face to face and when you occasionally engage on twitter and you see them pop up on twitter and tweet you get this false sense that you've like met each other and you've been in each other's lives for the last few years and i have to remind myself like oh no we've only spoken the one time back in 2017 and now we spoke this time and we've actually never met and it's a it's kind of a weird dissociative experience but there, we, there you have it. If you like this conversation as much as I did, go ahead and share it and tag me in the show on Twitter at CNF Pod or at Brendan O'Mara. Ugh. And uh, Creative Nonfiction Podcast on Instagram. I know. Ugh. And also consider heading to patreon.com slash CNF Pod. We've got a couple newbies. Yes. Thank you. So I'll throw a. You can throw a few bucks in the tip jar. Uh, the show is free, but as you know, it sure as hell ain't cheap. I recently added a post about my Prefontaine research this week with a photo, and it's available only to patrons. And don't forget, you can always rage against the algorithm with my up to 11 monthly newsletter by just going to brendanomera.com. Hey, hey. 
thinking of the tight deadline that I'm on with this book and uh, trying not to get freaked out. I mean, this, I, I usually, I routinely wake up between two and three in the morning and then I can't get back to sleep for at least two hours. And it's usually the tightness in the chest that comes with having to deliver on uh, the proposal. Um, so as some of you may know, my first draft of the gift is due April 24th. Uh, <laughs> meh, no, April 2024. I hope to write a biography that's in that 100,000 word range, maybe longer, definitely not shorter. It can't be shorter. And I'm thinking backward. How do we do this? Let's break it down. So I did the math on those NaNoWriMo folks who write 50,000 words in a month if they stick with it. Uh, if I did my calculations right, I believe that is 1,666 words per day. Let's just do that. 50,000 words. Uh, let's just divide it by 30 days, okay? Yep, 1,666. Yeah, doing math on a calculator is riveting audio. If after 11 to 12 months of research, can I write 100,000 words, roughly 400 double space pages in two months? So that taking that 1666 words a day, every day for 60 days, I think it's doable. I think it's possible to load the quiver with all the research, the, the interviews that I hope people will agree to and stop avoiding me. Uh, all the newspaper and magazine stuff uh, and, and get the outlines and all the, and the structure ready, you know, load the spring. And then what's 1666 divided by two? I think it's uh here we go. Here's more math. Great audio. 833 words. Can I write 833 words before noon? Take a breather. Write another 833 Maybe after a, a jog or a session, uh, session in the gym. That seems really manageable, right? Believe it or not, I wrote Six Weeks in Saratoga uh, you know, back in 2009, 2010, by doing close to 3,000 words a day. And that book was like 75,000, I think, in the end. I think. I, I mean, that... I wrote it, I wrote it in like four months, I think, but that includes like the re rereading and rewriting. Um, I did about 1,500 words in the morning, and I'd take a break and do another 1,500 in the afternoon. And I had, like, all my research, all my interviews. I had all the transcripts. So I, in a way, it was almost like taking dictation because all the, the heavy lifting was done, so the writing was kind of like the downhill part. 100,000 words in two months. It seems like a lot until you digest it. I, I mean, you don't eat a Chipotle burrito in one bite, you monster. You take little bites. You know, savoring it along the way. And by the end of your meal, you got a book. So stay wild, see you in efforts. And if you can't do, interview. See ya. See ya.